Uh, so essentially, I want to talk a little bit about how to create this thing with uh, Bitcoin JS lib for JavaScript users. I hear JavaScript is very popular. And of course, Rust Bitcoin. I didn't want to be all too overlapping with what uh, Steve has been talking about earlier. But uh, I have noticed as I was building the unit test suite in order to make sure that what I was presenting was actually going to work, that there is some overlap in what those libraries can do. But there is also a, a little bit of um, an area where you have to do things manually. Like there are some things that you have to implement manually in Bitcoin JS lib, other things you have to do manually in Rust Bitcoin. And I'll address those uh, shortly. But uh, because of this slight discrepancy, I have decided that I'm going to preface my presentation, which is actually going to be a demo, and some unit tests with a little overview of, uh, like an, an in-depth in overview of uh, how taproot uh, transactions and outputs and inputs are serialized. Uh, so I hope I don't overlap too much with what Steve and Lisa have said earlier today, that uh, I really want to dig, in, dig into the really meaty parts, just like we did last night, I guess. Uh, so first of all, all of you know that, of course, at the very high level, the things that Taproot supports are uh, primarily a key path spent where you don't reveal the fact that you have this tree of other scripts based on which you can spend your output, and a script path spend where you can spend from either one of those very bottom level leaves, and you don't actually have to create a signature for that spending mechanism. And the question is, we all know how that works in principle, but how exactly do you create the byte string or the byte sequence to do those things specifically? So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about how you construct the outputs, because in order to be able to spend an output, you first have to create that output. And uh, let's start with the assumption that you just want to generate your typical key pair, where you have a private key, which is just a big integer, 32 bytes and a compressed public key, 33 bytes, where the first uh, byte is uh, actually the, the parity byte, where uh, a 2 indicates the fact that the y coordinate is going to be even, and a 3 the fact that it's going to be odd. So if you are starting out like that, uh, the, the thing, the key pair that you are starting out with is essentially the internal uh, public key. It is the untweaked one. It is what you do before you add the whole miracle tree uh, onto that thing. So just going slightly back, this is the key that I'm talking about right now. So you generate that key pair. And uh, once you have that constructed, uh, there is one thing you have to do. So if your, if your public key is odd, you actually have to negate the secret key. Uh, this is uh, only relevant if you're going to be doing uh, key path spends later on. Otherwise, of course, your secret key doesn't really matter at all. But if you do want to have your secret key work with a taproot key path spend, just make sure that you negate it, which simply means subtracting the key value, the private key value from the curve order. Nothing really complicated about that. So then um, that is still your untweaked private key and your untweaked public key. I denote the tweak with uh, a prime. So Bless you. Oh, I, this is a dog. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot about our canine attendant. Uh, but if you want to, uh, in order to tweak your secret key, what you do is you just take the original untweaked secret key that may potentially be negated, and then you add the tweak to it. And the tweak is simply a hash, and the tweak is also interpreted as a big integer. For the public key, you do essentially the same thing, where you look at the point on the elliptic curve, and you add the tweak, which was multiplied with a generator point of secret 256k1. Really, nothing too complicated about that. And I'm going to show you the code that does it. Uh, the thing, though, is that after you tweak the public key, you also need to store the parity bit. Um, because once you tweak the public key, you are also going to have presumably a compressed 33 byte public key. And in order to do a skip path spend, note, not a key path spend, you're going to need to provide the parity bit as part of your control block. 
whose structure I'm also going to be talking about in a later slide. So I was talking about this uh, tweaking thing. And of course, here, the tweak property is a little vague. So let's dig a little bit into how we actually calculate the tweak. And there are a bunch of different scenarios that you may have. Because the best practice is if you have a taproot output without a Merkle tree attached to it, that you still want to tweak the, the key for some uh, cryptography safety reasons that I would defer to the cryptographers in this room. I guess like Lisa or Steve or Peter Vuya can talk about that better than I ever could dream of to. But um, the thing is, uh, in order to calculate the tweak for a pub key only taproot output, what you want to do is you take your original untweaked public key, you extract its x coordinate, which simply means if you have this compressed 33 byte format, you uh, strip away the first byte, and the remaining 32 bytes are the x coordinate, and then you simply put that into the into the tag hashing algorithm, where the tag is simply tap tweak. And uh, here I think it's really straightforward what hash underscore tap tweak means. I, I wish I could have done it uh, subscript, but this diagramming tool that I was using for the flowchart didn't let me. So here we are. Let's, um, let's explore a slightly more complicated scenario. So let's say you do have a Merkle tree attached. However, you only have one, one script. So you essentially have one tap leaf. This actually um, made, uh, well, it, it caused some complication for me myself because um, I, I had a bug where I was calculating the hash incorrectly. But essentially, the key thing to note, and I don't think that that is very clear from BIP 341 when you just look at the diagram, is that if you only have a tap leaf, you don't need to then subsequently hash the Merkle root using tap branch. Like all you do is you hash the tap leaf, and then your tweak is the tap tweak tagged hash of the concatenation of the Merkle root and the internal key. So the Merkle root, as I was just saying, you simply take the script, you hash it with the tap leaf a tag, and you dump it in there as the first part of your hash pre-image. And this is the, the internal key component is the same. You just take the x coordinate of your untweaked public key. And once you hash it, you're going to have a 32 byte output because it's shot of six. And you simply interpret that as a big integer. And there is your tweak. And because it's a big integer, you can trivially add it to your, uh, to your secret key or multiply it with a generator point and add it to your public key. I'm repeating myself, but I think it kind of bears repeating. So let's look at the most complicated scenario that you may have, which is where the top level uh, tree is actually uh, a branch that then branches out maybe into another branch and also into a leaf. So what you do here is also fairly straightforward. You hash the scripts, you hash the leaves using the tap leaf tag, and then you combine them. And whenever there is a branch, you hash the branch using the tap branch tag. And uh, that propagates all the way up to the Merkle root, which, again, you simply dump into the, uh, into the tap tweak preimage uh, alongside the x coordinate. So you see that the, the Merkle root comes first, then the internal key. And you hash that, and you have the tweak. One thing of note, by the way, and I think I might be addressing that in a follow-up slide, yeah, right here, is that when you're hashing a branch, and I, I, I want to talk about some details that you may want to be aware of. So first of all, when you're hashing a branch, you need to make sure that you sort the hashes of um, its children prior to actually calculating the hash of the branch. And uh, does anybody here know? why we want to sort that. Yeah, but what does the determin determinism help us with? Well, so the thing is, 
let's say we didn't sort it, right? That means that would mean that if we wanted to construct uh, if if we wanted to construct a spend based on a script such as either script A or script B, not only would would we have to reveal the hash of the sibling, we would also need to reveal the position of the sibling because depending on where it is, it, the revelation will be more complicated. And that, of course, would have to be repeated for each level of the tap tree. So I'm actually fairly proud of this sorting thing because that was literally the only idea I have ever contributed to Bitcoin. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, that, that, however, is the the branch hashing aspect, uh, the bra brain branch hashing aspect. Oh my god! But other than, other than sorting the the hashes of the leaves, there is really nothing to complicate. Like you literally sort them, concatenate it, and you hash it with the tag, and that's it. That that is going to produce the hash that you need to produce. For the leaves, it's actually a little more complicated than just hashing the script, as previous slides may have indicated. What you need to include in the leaf pre image is first of all the half leaf version, which right now is always 192. So if you take the byte uh, C0, that's going to do the trick. Then you have to also include the length of, of the script. I'm actually not sure why the length is necessary, because other places we are able to reveal it in, in different contexts. But uh, the point is that. If you're going to be doing this programmatically, you need to know that you need to include the length. And the length is serialized as a compact size. And that is, unfortunately, also something that Bitcoin JS Lib did not do. However, I, um, I, I created a little helper tool that is going to hash the tree for you as, as you need it to be hashed. And then, of course, you simply include the script. And that is going to produce the pre-image that you need to hash with the tap leaf tag. And, uh, that, that's pretty much it. Then you know you, you can follow all the steps that I have described in the previous slides, and you're going to have uh, the correct tweak that you need. Uh, by the way, if the other child is not a tap leaf but a tap branch, you still simply treat the hashes the same. You have a hash of the leaf, you have a hash of the branch, you sort them, and that is the that's going to be the hash of your overlying branch. So honestly, when you're looking at hash A and hash B and the branch hashing step, you absolutely don't care what the sources or what the pre-images of uh, these two uh, hash uh, inputs may have been. So let's actually create our first output, right? So uh, our output may be represented as an output script, or of course, uh, if we want to do, if we want to go for the human readability, we are going to create an address. So the first thing that we're going to do in a script which is what you're actually going to include in a transaction, is uh, you need the, the byte, which is 0x51. Or what, what is it? I believe it's 81, right? Uh, 51, that is hex. So in decimal, 5 times 16 plus 1, I believe 81. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't really matter because you're going to be operating with hex anyway. So then you have to push uh, 0x to 0. To 0 actually is 32 in decimal. And that is because the last step of your output script is simply the x coordinate of your external, that is your tweaked pub key. And that, uh, that x coordinate is always going to be 32 bytes. So all you're saying is, hey, I have this witness version, and I'm putting uh, 32 bytes on here. And those 32 bytes are the pub key. And uh, the witness version one, of course, is the one that signifies that this is uh, taproot not regular SegWit. So similarly, for the address, when you are calculating it using BEC32, uh, the, in, in mainnet, the human readable part prefix is BC. On uh, Rectus, it's BCRT. I haven't actually, I don't remember what it is for testnet. BCT. Well, there you go. Actually, fairly, fairly simple. And uh, the value that you're going to be encoding is also going to be the pub key, but with the uh, uh, 0, 1 prefix. So that is just one byte. And that byte indicates, first of all, that it is taproot as opposed to segwit. And it also tells all the things that are able to interpret and convert Bitcoin addresses that they are to use the BEC32M decoding scheme and not BEC32. 
because uh, there was this one vulnerability in BEC32 that we have found after releasing and merging and activating SegWit, uh, which was that if you had this one particular ending, I, I think Q, you could prefix it with yeah, a bunch of Bs. But that's just a little bit of trivia. It doesn't really matter too much. So let's see about, um, let's actually spend an output because now we have been able to create the first, the first output. We have an address or we have an output script or whatever it is that we may have. Let's, um, let's spend it. So all you really need to do is you, you need to create a Schnorr signature. And the signature hash flag, the, the, the sig hash flag is a new one that was just introduced. It was, I think, in BIP342. It's a sig hash default. And thankfully, both Bitcoin JS Lib and Rust Bitcoin are actually able to handle that. So I didn't have to manually implement uh, the sig hash input or pre-image calculation which is why I'm also conveniently going to gloss over its specifics. But it's fairly similar to a sig hash all with a couple of minor differences, really. And uh, but there are going to be code samples for both Bitcoin JSF and Rust Bitcoin in the link that I'm going to be sharing shortly. So then all you need to do is you have to uh, have one single witness element in your transaction when you're spending it. And that simply has to be the Schnorr signature. So as you can see, here, we don't really give a shit about the parity of the public, of the external public key, uh, because uh, the Schnorr signature is going to work, and uh, the, the Schnorr BIP actually takes care of calculating that anyway. So let's look into something a little more interesting. Let's look into a script path standing, which is, uh, uh, well, it, it requires a bunch of extra things. It requires the witness data, which consists of, uh, so the witness data, has three major parts when you spend a script path. First, it has all the inputs that you would regularly have in the same order as you would regularly disclose them for a script spend. And then the script itself, because uh, the Bitcoin consensus engine needs to be able to hash it and verify that the hash of the script, that the, the, the script is actually a corresponding pre-image that is going to mesh correctly with a control block. And the control block is uh, essentially just a very simple thing that tells the Bitcoin consensus engine which of your script paths you're going to be using. So let's dig into that a little bit more. Because usually when people talk about, oh, I want to spend from this particular script, they're thinking, oh my god, I, I'm going to have to figure out how to reveal the path to that one. And uh, you understand how to reveal a Merkle path in theory. But like in practice, you still have to serialize those bytes in a way that the consensus engine is going to understand. And that can be a, a little painful. So first of all, the control block starts with one byte that is either C0 or C1. And that is the version of the tap leaf that are going to be. And, and again, the version is always going to be 192 uh, with a bit or flag of the parity bit of the tweaked external public key. That is why on one of the early slides, I said you have to store the parity of your tweaked pub key. So, so far, nothing too complicated. Then simply the X coordinate of your untweaked public key, because now because of the script path, uh, because we're doing the script path, you have to make sure that uh, the untweaked public key plus the miracle tree are going to result in the correct tweak that actually corresponds to the address or the output script that we are uh, seeing on the blockchain. And lastly, the sibling hashes, starting with the deepest. So let's uh, talk a little bit about how that's going to work. Let's say we want to spend from script B. So I'm going to use the whiteboard just to make sure that it actually finds some use. Is this long enough? All right. So yeah, let's move the whiteboard right here. And I'm literally just going to copy over the, the Merkle tree, because here we have the Merkle root. We have this one branch underneath it, and the branch branches into another branch, where here we have C, and here we have A, and we have B. So if we wanted to spend B, what we need to reveal is the sibling hashes and the orders starting from the deepest, which means that 
the control block after those two bytes that I previously, um, after the one byte that I talked about and then the X coordinate. So, so far we are 33 bytes if you are keeping track. Uh, it's going to need to include the hash of the sibling. So this is the same hash that you have calculated anyway, right? So we just take the, the tap leaf, the, the tag tap leaf hash, and we concatenate that into our control block. Then we need the hash of the sibling at the next highest level. So in that case, it's going to be the hash of, um, of uh, tap leaf C. And at that point, that's actually, that's it. We don't have anything else. So your control block is going to be comprised of that first byte, the pop key, and then uh, two sets of 32 bytes. So 64 bytes after that. And uh, you can actually see that in it is, in fact, always uh, therefore a size that is um, 33 bytes plus n times 32 bytes, because we always have to have the first byte. We always have to have the uh, internal public key. And then depending on how many sibling hashes we need to reveal, that is the variable that we multiply with 32 bytes, because the hashes are always going to be 32 bytes. And um, that is kind of all the use I'm going to get out of this whiteboard. Yeah, so, so first, uh, deepest first. So uh, the, the 32 bytes, you, first you have the tab leave tagged hash of A, and then the tap leave tag hash of C. How do I know if it's left or right? What do you mean? Yeah. It's sorted. Oh, yeah. It's deterministic. Okay. 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 You don't have to reveal it, and that is why it's only n of 32 bytes, not n of 33 bytes. I guess if we didn't sort it deterministically and we had to reveal it, then in principle, we could also have uh, tap trees with more than two children per branch. Because if it's just one byte, we could say, oh, you know, this is that sibling and that sibling and that sibling. But it could grow fairly quickly. And we would also need to reveal whether it is a sibling for this current step or a sibling for the next one. So you probably need to do some uh, bitmap uh, trickery. It's easier with two. So I guess whatever. It's a, it's a design decision that has not already been made, but it is still, I think, uh, a thought experiment worth pondering. <laughs> well, there you go. Let's, uh, let's introduce another fucking format. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so I, I believe it is time for some demos. And uh, you can go over to my GitHub, which uh, and I have just open sourced uh, these two. I don't really want to say libraries, just repositories. And um, due to some of the limitations of Bitcoin JS lib, I actually had to create some code myself in there. But in Rust Taproot, in Rust Bitcoin, everything is available. So all Rust Taproot is is literally unit tests. So feel free to take a look and. Um, I want to do some demos where I first do a key path spend in Bitcoin JS lib, and then we do this, the same key path spend in um, Rust Bitcoin, and then we do some script path spending using a hash preimage revelation script. So let's leave this thing and let's go right here. And um, all right, are you all able to see where I'm at? Is the font big enough? All right, well, perfect. So here, let me minimize this thing because it is annoying. Okay, I can't zoom. I, I hate zoom. Huh. Like, why, why are we letting the Chinese spy on us when we should be letting the Americans spy on us? Uh, yeah, I, I support the NSA. That is why I always wear my EFF hoodie. Um, the thing is, though, it, it, it's fine. The demos are going to be fairly short. So let, let's just take a brief look at this code. So we're starting with uh, the standard mechanism by which we create uh, a key pair in Bitcoin JS lib, which is using the EC pair paradigm. They, they have this nice thing. If you have ever worked with Bitcoin JS lib before, or if you're going to work with Bitcoin JS lib, I, th this is definitely going to be something that you're familiar with, and it's uh, going to make more sense. And so we have a private key that is comprised of a bunch of uh, concatenated ABBAs. 
because they are very hexadecimal and make good music. Uh, so let's maybe switch it up a little bit. Well, let's switch up the first four bytes, uh, the first four characters, the first two bytes. Uh, does anybody have any hex suggestions that they want to try out to make sure? AC, DC. <laughs> All right. Well, well, so what we're doing here is that we're going to be, we, we have this new private key that is starting with ACDC and a bunch of ABBAs after that. And here, we're going to be calculating a taproot output. And that is actually a method that I had to implement myself. But you have access to it in the repository that I have shared link with. And uh, what this method produces is, uh, in typical JavaScript TypeScript fashion, a dictionary with four properties, an address, a script pub key, which is just the output script, the parity bit, and a tweaked private key if uh, the EC pair had a private key, which in this case it did. And uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to print the address that we have just uh, created. So let's actually do that. Let's print the address and let's send some money to ourselves. All right, address and let's preface it with the actual address output. All right, let's make sure that it actually ran that thing and let's uh, run something. Okay, should create free list output and transaction. Here we go. Are you able to see all, all this? Okay, here we go. Okay, well, Oh, I didn't, didn't echo the address. Well, that's annoying. But uh, we have the address here anyway. So here we have the rectus address. So let's send ourselves some money in here. And here I have a little rectus manager that I built for myself because I just wanted to be able to mine to an address. And I'm going to mine myself 101 blocks such that we get past the maturation period. And it's mining. It's mining. It can be a little slow, but it actually succeeded. Thank God, because I was starting to get worried. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as opposed to 30 minutes of waiting for testnet, exactly. So here we have a couple of latest transactions. So let's look at this one. And here we have actually mined to just the very output that we have created, because as you can tell, this is the address that we saw right here. It ends in 2NS, and here it ends in 2NS. So we have one and spent that we can actually use. And in JavaScript, which you will actually be able to see in my examples, uh, I, I have to reverse the, the buffer and, and tap root. Uh, I mean, in Rust, I don't have to do that. But the point is, um, I have just pasted the output, uh, the, the transaction ID in here. The output index is always zero because it is a Coinbase spend. Uh, also a way of making things a little bit easier for myself. So let's just calculate the new transaction output, the transaction hex at the bottom, and then spend it. So the transaction hex that we got is this thing. So let's just go back to the Rectus Manager and broadcast this little transaction of ours. And we got a transaction ID. So if perhaps we were to mine another block, like here, let's, let's, let's mine to some address that we're never going to be using today. Let's mine to this one, just such that our thing doesn't change, right? And we go back to the address that we were using, which is this one. All right, where is the address? Where is the address? All right, here we go. Uh, so let's go to, uh, all right, here, here we go. We, we see that we now have two unspents because our transaction has gone through. Uh, and now let's actually try the same thing with uh, script path spend. Uh, because I guess I only have 10 minutes, so let's do the JavaScript examples. The, top, uh, the, the Rust examples are fairly easy. So here I have a, a Merkle tree with literally just one leaf, where we want to prove that we know the pre-image uh, to a hash that is based on the word arc. But let's temporarily abandon my narcissism and try flip by LA rocks. All right, and let's run that one. And let's actually see what um, our hash is going to be. So our hash here is going to be 340 whatever. 
So the thing that is really nice about Bitcoin JS lib is that you can assemble a script from ASM. And that is not something that Rust Bitcoin lets you do, unfortunately. Uh, so let's, uh, I, I just switched out this hash. So let's actually construct the address and see what we're going to be needing to send money to here. So the address is going to be this thing. So let's once again mine 101 blocks to attend an MMP. Can I? No, I can't not send myself money. I want to send myself money. Why would I not send myself money? Well, what? Oh, send somebody else. Yes, I could send somebody else money, but the thing is, in the unit test, it's easier to just reuse the, the output script that I have already calculated. So it's, uh, um, I guess I could create an up return output script. Ah, it, it doesn't matter really, but uh, I like sending myself money. And you should too. So here we have just created this transaction. We have um, this other output, we have this address, where if we go, we see that we have an unspend that we can now spend. And we also have 50 Bitcoin that um, 50 Bitcoin worth of spending. So let's get the transaction idea of that one and uh, create a spend. So you can see that when I was constructing this, I had significantly less money than I do right now. So let's actually remedy that situation such that I have two, three, four. And OK, yeah, th this should be fine. Uh, so let's spend the, the transaction that I have uh, just created. And we are proving that we know the free image to this output. And you can see that here, I'm just simply putting the free image in here in the witness element. And then the next step is literally just the tap script. Note that when you're putting the witness in the, you know, putting the script in the witness, you don't need to preface it with the, the compact size or, or the version like that. That is actually taken care of in the control block. And lastly, of course, the control block, which is also very easily calculated using this example. So let's run it. Let's see which transaction hex I'm going to get for this new thing. And let's see whether it's actually going to work, because demos, as you know, are fickle. And it worked. Nice. So I very strongly encourage you to actually look at this. If I had more time, I think I could do a, a live demonstration where I try to make two leaves in a branch, and I decide which free image we reveal for that one. However, I do want to spend just a very quick second showing you the code where we do the same thing in Rust Bitcoin. So in Rust Bitcoin, oh, beach ball of death. Yeah. In, in Rust Bitcoin, we are able to create the private key using the same mechanism, essentially, uh, but uh, using slightly different, using the other libraries. And there, we are also able to take the internal key for that. And then we have a really nice uh, taproot builder interface where we can dump everything into it. Like we, we can dump the internal key. And then we can also add leaves to it if we needed it. And then it produces an address and an output script for us. And if you want to spend the transaction, figuring out how to do the sig hash was a little more complicated because the documentation, I don't, I don't mean to be. Uh, well, I, I don't mean to criticize, but it was utterly lacking because there is something about REST libraries and not showing examples, but just having the function annotations and docs RS, which are great, but utterly useless. Because uh, you know some method signatures are just too ambiguous, and you, you have no idea how you're supposed to go about doing some things. So I very strongly encourage you to take a look at how the SIG hash is constructed here. But the point is, um, my example does cover both a keys path spend and a script path spend. And if we were to run this particular unit test, we would be getting an address, we would be getting a transaction, an output script, and really everything. But why is it compiling? I didn't change anything. Ugh. Yeah, but uh, if you have the same input, you would actually be able to see that the addresses match. So what was it? Was it ACDC? Oh, no, that was not it. So if we do ACDC, and we rerun it, and we recompile it, and we look at what address we produce, we see that I actually had a little assert equal. So let's perhaps 
do away with that one. And let's also do away with that one because it does fail the unit test. However, now that we are going to just print the address output, you will note it. Where? Where do I still have an assert equal? Ah, here we go. Sorry. Live, live demos uh, never work. However, the address is the same one ending into an S that we recognized from earlier using the JavaScript test. So it's really nice to have this consistency across the different implementations. And um, if you have any questions or you notice bugs, particularly in the thing that I had to create myself for Bitcoin JS Hub and JavaScript, let me know. And um, I guess that's, that's pretty much it. So uh, thank you very much for listening. And I hope this was uh, remotely insightful. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so going back to like the presentation, but you just wanted to say that um, the max size of the implementation is probably heavily in the past. Well, Bitcoin JS lib does not actually support, support assembling a, a tap tree. So I, I had to create a little helper class for that myself, which is available in the repository that I shared. Uh, they do support creating the SIG hash, and uh, that is easily calculatable. But all you need to do is essentially, if you want to do a, a key path spend, you need to adjust the tweak yourself. And again, my, my thing takes care of that. If you want to do a script path spend, you have to do everything yourself or use my uh, Shetty class. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, yes. That is correct. Yeah, so definitely make sure that your, your script leaf free image serialization. Oh, no, Bitcoin JS lib doesn't support it. The bug that I had was that I wasn't, the, that if, if I only had a tap leaf at the root, I would still add a tap branching hash on top of that, which is wrong. Do not do that. That also made my tree unspendable. Uh, but yeah, anything else? All right, well, I, I hope that was sufficiently detailed that you are now able to serialize your own taproot outputs and, and inputs and, and all that. So I can't wait to see what all of you are going to build. Thanks. Thanks.